Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, from uh, the Milkoli in Kigali, Rwanda. This is the first of the three installments of the Road to Diverse Conversations uh, by the World Economic Forum in partnership with CNBC Africa. And uh, we'll be focusing and anchoring our conversations on African competitiveness, based, of course, on the African Competitiveness Report uh, in, launched in June of 2015. Without much ado, I'd like to invite my very able panel to guide us through this conversation. I'll start with the host uh, from my immediate left, uh, Honorable Francis Gatere. He is the Chief Executive Officer at the Rwanda Development Board and a member of the Cabinet. Thank you. Also, a man who is new, not new to African conversations, I'm talking about Gabriel Negatu, who is the Director for East African Regional Resource Center at the African Development Bank. Also, last but certainly not least, Wil Wilmot Allen, who is a director for East Africa uh, for Cross Boundary and uh, an investor, very uh, critical part of this conversation as we look outside, looking in. Ladies and gentlemen, please give them a round of applause. I think it will only be fair to get this show on the road to get a better overview. We had the conversations and we listened to the report about competitiveness in the region. But I'd like to give Mr. Negatu, you've worked in the region for a pretty long time. Uh, give us a climate of exactly how things stand as far as productivity is concerned. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I think the presentation that was made earlier on the 2015 competitiveness report is pretty much on target. Uh, that uh, competitiveness overall, I think, which is a function of the, 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 the workings of the economy, is, is particularly in the East Africa region, is, is improving a little. Uh, again, relative to the other regions uh, in the continent, uh, the East Africa region seems to be doing reasonably well. But, again, as was pointed out, within the East Africa region, there is quite a disparity. And it's sort of, uh, yes, we are improving, but we are pulling apart. Some countries, and most notably this country here, is pulling apart, while others are either staying uh, fixed or falling behind. So. Uh, it's, it's a mixed picture. Uh, and as I said, this competitive, competitiveness is partly a function of how well the economy is doing. And, and, and as you know, the East African economy over the past few years uh, had been registering quite impressive growth, robust growth. But uh, this year and perhaps in the next few years, we'll begin to see a slowdown. Uh, I think this narrative about Africa rising and so on was largely based on the, uh, or built on the back of a rising commodity uh, prices and boom and, and so on. And with that decline, some of our countries in the region that, 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 uh, that were riding that uh, boom will now begin to register a lower growth. But that said, uh, again, most economies in this region are reasonably diversified. And uh, the impact will, of course, be felt, but uh, uh, I suspect not as much as some other regions uh, in the continent. Still in just setting the tone, I'd like to bring in Honorable Gattari to just, uh, uh, you've obviously been uh, the driver's seat of uh, a team that has been responsible for a lot of economic transformation in Rwanda, uh, the RDB. Uh, what sort of thoughts come to your mind when you looked at that report? Well, um, thank you very much, Bonnie. Several things come to mind. One is when I look at uh, Rwanda's improvements in uh, competitiveness and the rank we have, uh, we take pride in being uh, ranked the most competitive in our region. But at the same time, uh, we realize that uh, at 58, uh, uh, 58th ranking globally, uh, we still have a long way to go to become really globally competitive. Uh, that's one lesson. The second thing is, uh, when I reflect on where Rwanda has come from and the efforts that have gone into uh, deliberately working towards improving the competitiveness and doing business environment of our country, uh, I realize that competitiveness cannot be left to chance. It has to be. Uh, a result of hard work. Uh, 
And so it cannot be something that just happens. Thirdly, uh, I also realize that competitiveness is very complex and is a result of contributions of multiple stakeholders. And as a result, uh, it's not something that will be achieved overnight because each stakeholder must contribute simultaneously with the other. And so it will only uh, be uh, an incremental process and it's a journey. Uh, I'm happy that uh, Rwanda is uh, on the right course of that journey. Let me just bring in Wilmot Allen uh, to this conversation. Wilmot, you have uh, obviously the chance of looking at this whole competitiveness uh, conversation from a very uh, uh, impartial point of view, being an investor into the region. Uh, what is the true picture of East Africa from outside? Great. Well, just to clarify, actually, there's a juxtaposition in my role. Cross Boundary is an investment firm. Uh, we operate as an investment advisor to transactions, but also managing an energy fund, which is a fund for commercial enterprises investing in solar. So in that role, I both uh, have perspective on the appetite and the perspective of investors who are looking to come into the region, as well as companies that are here are looking to grow their businesses. And in commentary, I think, on the competitiveness report, what I would add from the investor perspective is that I think it's really important to follow the money into East Africa. I think the picture looks obviously a little different when you think about the country markets that are attracting FDI as well as private equity capital. <clears throat> And also, I think that a greater story now is that private institutional capital is not only coming into the region, but it's exiting. And uh, that is something that I don't think is quite perhaps as well cap captured in the report, uh, but it's part of the narrative. I believe East Africa is the most dynamic economically region in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that um, as looking both from an advisory perspective as well as from an investor uh, perspective and the clients that we work with as well as our role as managing a fund, um, I would say there's another salient point about East Africa uh, that I'm not sure how it maybe stacks up to, compared to the other regions, but it is important and that is the role of the diaspora coming back, adding to the talent mix and when it, when it comes to investing in companies, being able to deploy capital in, but exiting and making sure it's well stewarded, well managed, that's also important. So I, I think this is a very important conversation. I think the outlet on East Africa is still bullish from a private institutional capital perspective. And I also think that even in terms of impact investors, which is another segment of the investment market, um, it's, it's really a brighter day. It's a good picture. As you look at the strategies to improve EAC's competitiveness as a region. Obviously, there's a lot of focus on in, in the individual uh, countries, but I'd like to look at uh, just three main indicators that obviously have been driving conversation. And uh, key among them has been infrastructure development in the region. We've seen um, tons of money, um, for lack of a better word, put into this project. And I've seen a guy to smile. Um, there's a lot of critics that have been saying, perhaps African or East African countries are putting too much into if infrastructure, and infrastructure at some point does not really uh, mean uh, economic growth. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm smiling because yeah, we've been part of that uh, tons of money going to infrastructure. Uh, Bonnie, let no one tell you that infrastructure is not the foundation for economic growth. No one. That, because that. the sense was, and uh, this was coming from a lot of uh, investment into bandwidth growth, into superhighways in Nairobi, and people, there's the analogy where why build a big pipe when there's nothing to flow through it? Do we have the capacity for the infrastructure that we're building? That's what I'm getting at. Well, the, pipe, the pipeline is not on yet, so we won't uh, comment, and uh, there will be stuff to flow through it. But uh, the, 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 the bottom line is, look, infrastructure is the, the foundation on which econ economies grow whether it's highways, uh, ports, uh, airports, uh, IT, you, you name it. You know, if our economies in this region are going to work towards integrating and creating larger markets and so on, uh, you, you can't do this with, uh, in the absence of a physical infrastructure, railway thing. If our IT systems, uh, payment systems, this that are going to, it's going to happen on the back of a bandwidth system that, that covers the whole region. And I think 
East African leadership in this regard has been very visionary, very foresighted in having invested a big part of the development budget into infrastructure. You know, when you build roads, you, you know the Tika Highway, uh, super highway in, 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 in Nairobi. When you build roads, you don't just build a road from point A to point B. It's not a brick and mortar project. You, you transform lives. You transform communities. You open markets. You create jobs. You increase property values. So, and the same goes for uh, power. I mean, uh, look at the last mile connectivity program or the NELSAP program in the East Africa region that's connecting all of East Africa by transmission line. If you are a small business person, whether you run a hairdresser shop or a small welding shop, what can you do without power? You know, having 98% of Kenyan sh schools have access to electricity, what can you substitute for that? Uh, human development was one of the factors of uh, competitiveness that was pointed out. So I think the investment in infrastructure, perhaps there is a lag effect. You may not see the, the payback today uh, for what you've invested today. There's a lag effect a few years and so on. But it is by, by far the, the best return you can get on your investment is infrastructure. Right. Uh, let me just bring in Honorable Gattare because from the presentation earlier on, uh, the World Economic Forum report equates competitiveness to productivity. You obviously sit in government. Uh, give us a sense of your priority when we talk about infrastructure development. Mm -hmm. uh, our view as government about productivity is that uh, productivity growth happens at the intersection of effectiveness and efficiency. And a key variable of this intersection is cost, cost of doing business. And so when the government is looking at investments into infrastructure, at the back of the mind is how can government contribute in reducing the cost of doing business for the private sector. We are mindful of the fact that government cannot directly subsidize businesses. Uh, we are mindful of the fact that government cannot interfere directly in the business operations of individual companies, but that government can contribute indirectly in meeting some of the costs that otherwise would make companies unproductive or businesses uh, be less productive. And infrastructure is one of those. Now, there are different layers of infrastructure, obviously uh, physical infrastructure in terms of roads, uh, 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 rail, railroads uh, and others are very important, but there's also, there's also uh, uh, soft infrastructure which we are very uh, mindful about. Uh, for example, if you look at some of the cost of doing business across our region, uh, uh, a lot of it doesn't have to do with the distance uh, that tracks travel. A lot have to do with some of the uh, non-tariff barriers that they meet across, uh, across those roads. Uh, as we speak, uh, uh, our, our leaders are in Nairobi uh, discussing across the northern corridor on ways to streamline trade across that corridor. And a lot of it has to do with how to make transportation business across borders not only effective, but very cost uh, uh, friendly. And so we take note of that, uh, but also we look at productivity in terms of some of the other uh, foundational uh, investments that the government can make that will not only increase productivity in current terms, but in future uh, terms. So in education, in healthcare, uh, in, uh, in technology, and other forms of uh, productivity enhancing investments. Um, Alan, Honorable Gatari has just uh, thrown us into what we wanted to get into next, which is the, the cost of doing business. And I'd just like you to, to pick a cue on that. We've talked about this whole infrastructure, and we're saying it's not just about putting down the brick and mortar. There's the cost implication that, that come to it. Um, having uh, set up a business in Nairobi, uh, one of the East African countries that, by the way, didn't perform too well, 99 out of uh, uh, the whole list is not too good. But um, what is your perception of the cost of doing business uh, uh, in, in East Africa? Sure. 
Again, I think the record is really mixed at this point. I think that there are serious problems which have been mentioned, uh, particularly if you look at the role of agriculture in East Africa and how logistics, logistic services, transport uh, still remain challenges. There's new money coming in. There's, there are advances, uh, particularly in cold chain shipment. Uh, but I also think that there has been innovation. There has been innovation like Encopa. There has been innovation like mobile money, which whether it's communications infrastructure or energy infrastructure, uh, East Africa, I think, to some extent, arguably, is leading the way. And so that innovation is an attracting investment. It's promoting financial inclusion. And it's also giving entrepreneurs new ways to have access to finance. Interesting. Let's just go back to that whole point of innovation um, as driving this uh, beat and, and the ease of doing business. Taxation has been a big, big uh, part of this conversation and very notorious, especially for Kenya. Um, do you feel, let me start with, with Negatu because you've operated in this market. Do we feel as East African uh, markets we're giving enough incentives to um, investors coming in, before we talk about the local investors, investors coming in uh, in the focus areas of uh, manufacturing and infrastructure. If you're to pick taxation, for example, do you feel we're giving them enough incentives? Uh, this is not a scientific response, but I think we're giving too much, actually. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, an investor deciding whether to locate in Kenya or Tanzania or uh, Rwanda has several issues to consider. Productivity, transport, this, that, and the other. And tax incentives are pretty well down the list, you know. What is important is, are these tax taxes predictable? Do I know them going in? So there's no changing the rules of the game halfway through. But once I know what those taxes will be, you factor those into the cost of doing business. Uh, so this notion that we, we all outdo one another by giving more taxes uh, so the, the investors begin to play, play one country against the other, it's, it's called the, 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 the race to the bottom because you're constantly uh, outdoing the ne next country by giving better tax holidays that is not going to attract a serious investor. Right. I think a serious investor will do a lot of due diligence, a lot of consideration. Yes, taxes, within reason, uh, what gets taxed uh, matters, the rates matter and so on, but more important is predictability of those taxes. But if you ask me today, no, our countries, in fact, are giving too much in, in terms of uh, tax incentives and not getting enough return. There was a study done by uh, one of these. Uh, Alan, do you agree with that? Yeah. Well, you know, um, i rather focus on incentives, generally speaking. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it to my colleagues <laughs> <laughs> about taxes. The private yeah. sector, you yes. know, I, I think uh, the good story there, again, again, I'm bullish, but I think the good story there is that there are some incentives in key sectors that are making a difference. Mm -hmm. In the area of cotton, textiles, and apparel, for example, AGOA was just extended for 10 years. Uh, the third country uh, fabric partnership or agreement was also extended. And I think that the regulatory environment throughout the region in terms of integration is a real serious topic for discussion. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Right. But internationally speaking now, there is an opportunity, particularly in the sector such as CAT, for East Africa to sort of control the value chain with the assistance of other international players, buyers in the US and Europe, right. uh, manufacturers that are bringing technology transfer, um, labor to some extent, uh, from China to manufacturing. And so I think, yes, taxation does remain uh, an issue that's very interesting, and I think it varies uh, from region to region. But there are incentives now for key sectors that are making a way. I also think that as we continue the conversation, the work towards integration, that um, there might be an opportunity for more of a specialization yeah. around production, around business, that might incentivize governments to follow the lead of the private sector mm -hmm. to improve incentives 
uh, in, in the area of taxes and in other areas of private sector development. Right, and we'll, we'll, we'll think or uh, uh, close on the integration topic just a little bit. Uh, Mr. Nagat, we'll get back <coughs> to you because I know we cut you out, but let's just stick to the tax issue and flip it a bit. We talked about foreign investors, but uh, uh, Honorable Gatere, do you feel like East African nations, and Rwanda in particular, you're giving enough incentives for um, manufacturers and local players who want to set up, uh, domestic people who want to set up here? Uh, I believe in incentives. Uh, I believe that businesses, like human beings, respond to incentives. And that when the incentives are right, the response uh, will follow suit. Uh, but I also believe that there are different types of investors. And so uh, incentives, not all kinds of incentives will be for everyone. And so it's very important that incentives are tailor-made uh, to specific requirements of different uh, investors. What we are seeing is that generally businesses want to pay their taxes. Uh, that businesses generally want to make money first and pay taxes as well. What we find uh, is that at the initial stages of investments, businesses want to defer uh, the taxes uh, uh, to have those absorbed into your investments. And so uh, we work with investors to see how best uh, they can have investments that are going into uh, revenue generating investments with a view to building long-term relationships that will yield uh, tax revenues to, to the country. Is there room for that sort of cushioning, especially in the first few years of the, uh, when starting the business? Depending on, 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 on businesses and their specific requirements, absolutely, uh, there always is room uh, for that. Uh, but we also are cognizant of the fact that capital is global today, and especially for foreign investments, uh, the options often presented to them are wide. And so we want to get uh, a fair share, but uh, a, a large fair share uh, to our region. And so we want to be competitive, not just through incentives, but through some of the other competitive, let me say, productive enhancing uh, incentives, which are not going to be financial or fiscal in nature. When we talk to investors, they are looking at how well they can get labor force, how well they can retain their labor force, the cost of that labor. They are looking at the administrative cost of not only starting a business, but running a business. Uh, they are looking at the uh, predictable cost of doing business and the non-predictable cost of doing business, uh, often known as corruption. And that is very important uh, for them. And so we concentrate on ensuring that those unpredictable costs of doing businesses are non-existent in our country, and as a result, uh, turn it around into a major incentives for businesses to, to, to establish here. Yes, Alan, please. What I'll add to that in area of uh, incentives and also tax policy, I think, and this was uh, alluded to during, I think, the Q&A period, there is a large part of the economy, economy that doesn't factor in to taxation in most African countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, the informal economy. And so I think there's a grand opportunity for innovation, uh, and we're seeing some of that with the bottom of the pyramid or base of the pyramid impact investors coming in. And I think to a certain extent, uh, mobile money also uh, emanates from that as well. But I, I think as we move forward in terms of competitiveness, there has to be greater inclusion, not only for the purposes of, of increasing life opportunities, development outcomes, but also fiscal sustainability. Indeed. We'll have to jump into the break. And uh, if you're joining us now, you're watching the first installment of the Road to Davos Conversations in East Africa, Kigali, Rwanda. And we are discussing how can we uh, have strategies of improving the ESC competitiveness, obviously based on the World Economic Forum Competitiveness Report of 2015 for Africa. We'll, after the break, we'll be talking about the integration question in the region.
Welcome back. You're watching the World Economic Forum Road to Davos here in Kigali, Rwanda. And the conversation is strategies for improving EAC's competitiveness. On my panel, I have immediate uh, left is a Honorable Francis Gattare. He's a Chief Executive Officer of the Rwanda Development Board and a member of the Rwandan Cabinet. Also, I have uh, Mr. Gabriel Negatu, Director for East Africa Regional Resource Center at the African Development Bank. And I have Mr. Wilmot Allen, who is a director for East Africa at Cross Boundary. My, my name is Bonnie Tunya. And uh, for this second half, I'd like us to shift our focus to the integration question. And the question is, which one comes first, regional uh, priority or national priority? Because the conversation about integrating in the region has been, how best do we improve competitiveness? And I'll give you a case in point. A couple of months ago, there was debate in Nairobi whether to allow sugar imports from Uganda into the country. A lot of farmers and critics said this would kill the local industry. The question is, is there room for improved competitiveness? And I'd like to start with Alan. Um, in the region, uh, in the wake of what is happening globally, which one do we go for first, regional or national? Well, I think empirically the decision has already been made. It's national. And I think the challenge now is to add to that. Um, the, the whole prospect of integration, which has its challenges, of course, has its opportunities. Um, opportunities in terms of the requirement for uh, integration of regulatory policy, complementary businesses, uh, economic diversification, and then I think what's also equally important to both of those, labor mobility. And I think that's really the, the challenge is the synchronization of all of those without diminishing what's working in the individual states. Um, my larger question around that would be the government uh, will to do so and how that motivation happens. Uh, the private sector, I believe, would help drive that. Just observing historically what's happened in Asia uh, through ASEAN, what's happened in Europe. Uh, there was uh, economic and a business reason uh, which became primary, which motivated the integration. And I think that we're coming to a time where East Africa has become a destination, an attractive destination for capital, uh, for business development, SMEs are growing here, where that decision can be made. And I think that the onus of that will be upon the political leadership in consultation with the private sector, but definitely driven by the political leaders to make that happen. Mr. Nagato has been shaking his head all through. <laughs> you don't seem to agree with that. Controversial. <laughs> uh, no, just saying to Alan, you know, I'm going to be controversial and, and disagree. No, I, I, in fact, you know, I'll, I'll take it one step back and, and disagree with, the, with your questioning because th this, this dichotomy, the false dichotomy, uh, whether it's national or regional, which one should, should take precedence. You know, uh, you can have serve the national interest by going regional. And, and, and the example you've given is a very good one. Uh, Kenya, uh, the debate on sugar. Uh, integration, there are always winners and losers, like any, 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 any process. Integrating has winners and losers, and not integrating also has winners and losers. So if you go the route of integration, yes, there will be some winners and losers, but that's why you need a managed integration. For example, if it's a new industry, what you call an infant industry, an upcoming industry, you create an environment where you protect that industry to give it time to develop and, and, and so on and so forth. Sugar in Kenya is a 100-year-old industry. Right. Now, is it in the national interest to keep sustaining uh, an inefficient, non-competitive industry? Is it in the best interest of the Kenyan consumers to buy sugar at a much higher rate because it's produced domestically versus uh, coming from next door? In that case, yeah. someone would wonder, what is the difference then from, uh, between having sugar from Uganda or Brazil? Because if you're talking about cost, yeah. uh, for the person just picking it off the sh uh, supermarket shelf, it really doesn't matter where it came from. Uh, then is there a case for uh, uh, or, or, uh, or any benefits for opening up a market regionally? In principle, yes, right. there is. Now, again, as I said, it's not just a willy-nilly, just open wide and let uh, markets dictate everything. You know, you, you need to manage this process, mm -hmm. depending on the industry, the length of duration, and, and, and what have you. But 
what you do not want to do, what is not in the best interest of your nation and your economies to keep nurturing these inefficient economies by giving them subsidies, in which case they have no incentive to become efficient, right. to become competitive. So they will spend more time, and this has been proven time and again, on subsidies and uh, things. They will spend more time lobbying government on not removing the subsidy rather than becoming efficient. We, we have a member of the government here. Let's, let's hear what uh, Honorable Gutierrez has to say. Do we have uh, instances where advancing a regional agenda is self-limiting? We believe that regional integration should not be seen as a zero-sum game. Uh, when it's perceived as such, it creates limitations to the process. And what we are experiencing currently in some of the industries that you just referred to are precisely examples where uh, some industries perceive uh, integration to be leading towards a zero-sum game. And that hesitation creates uncertainty as to whether uh, there is actually a commitment to going uh, completely regional. What we need is to continue to communicate that regional integration is A, a process, but B, a process that has got to be completed so that there is no ambiguity to believe, uh, to create a belief that perhaps uh, economies will continue to compete and therefore some of the uh, existing inefficiencies will continue to survive. Allow me to just uh, jump in. As we speak now, the East African heads of state are meeting in Nairobi, and obviously it is very easy to integrate around building a road or a bridge across. But when it's about your people uh, crossing into the other country to get employment opportunity, when it's about uh, uh, moving goods and services, then we have harmonization uh, difficulties that come in the way. And for some reason, we cannot, um, we think, uh, we have or we set different standards for goods moving from, say, country A to B. Um, is it that it's easy to integrate on certain issues like infrastructure and uh, manufacturing in other sectors becomes a difficult uh, challenge? I think it's easy to manage the short-term uncertainty and short-term risk when you are managing it as a project with a period, with a budget, with uh, a definitive uh, outcome. But I think that regional integration has got to be driven by an ambition, by a vision, uh, that then should be shared between the leaders and the population so that everyone becomes a stakeholder into this. When the communication is such that national interests are seen to be uh, protected and that national interests are seen to be contradictory with regional interests and that is demonstrated even to the highest level. Then it becomes a bottleneck to actually implementing a, a, a regional integration. And so what I have seen, particularly in our country here in Rwanda, is that our leadership has not only been ambitious, but also has been able to embrace the uncertainty of opening up and embracing the possibilities of what could become uh, an otherwise very productive region and unilaterally welcome East Africans without requiring passports, only with IDs, opening up the labor market for participation and create the idea that we can actually have a region where people can not only move freely but work freely wherever they uh, choose to be. And my feeling is that this kind of leadership is required to demonstrate that there is nothing to fear, that perhaps there may be some short-term anxieties, but in the long run, we are all going to be winners. Uh, Alan, is it either or? Do we have a situation where we can achieve both? We can have our cake and eat it because, um, like we said, it's easy to integrate around some issues, but some are, are too emotional. Um, conversations about uh, movement of skilled labor, for example. It is easy for government to say, we'll give you, you don't need a passport, come through. But once you get to that country, there's a conversation about, do we have a skilled uh, Rwandan uh, first before we give you this job and things like that? Um, is it either or? I think 
that it has to be a process that is gradual, uh, that is strategic, and that's sort of uh, targeted in the sense of, for the private sector, I would say that logistics, transportation, infrastructure, that would be a primary interest as a place to start. And then gradually moving to other areas of, of integration, working your way up to, to currency, perhaps. And I, so I think that there are a lot of risk that potentially could choke out the, the advances and the progress. Um, and I also think that, again, in the conversation about regional integration, uh, what is the benefit of sort of workforce development practices being shared, uh, best practices being, being shared, uh, education uh, and tertiary and secondary education uh, systems and, and approaches to, to building those institutions, that being part of the conversation of integration in terms of what, what best practices, what best approaches uh, are actually shared throughout the region. But to answer your question, I, I don't think it's uh, either or. I think it's both and. But I think there is a temporal dimension to it. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that's going to take a lot of strategic planning and a lot of patience. Mr. Nagato, we know where your vote is in terms of all this question, but what do you see as the biggest threat to this? Because we, we all seem to agree there's a lot to be gained with uh, regional competitiveness uh, or productivity as a good. Where, uh, what do you see as the biggest threats to this? Threats? Yes. Threats to what, integration or competitiveness? Regional integration. Uh, threats to integration. You know, this uh, integration thing is uh, one of those phenomena where you have what's known as exit before entry. Those that are affected negatively will feel the impact most immediately. You know, uh, farmers, importers, and those, the new beneficiaries, the new winners, there'll be a lag effect in terms of w how soon they realize the, the benefit. So th this then drives the political will. The lobbying, the advocacy that goes in, in place and, uh, you know, just within this region, uh, the movement of uh, maize or uh, agricultural produce between Kenya and Tanzania, very difficult. A lot of non-tariff barriers, if you go to Namanga, or, or all these uh, issues, it's because there are, on both sides, there are uh, lobby groups, interests that, 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 uh, that that, that work in the way. Uh, so it's, don't confuse national interest with sector, you know, uh, industry interest. In the, also in, the, now is the sector yeah, interest. Yeah, the sector that interest. Also has a vote the fruit growers or yes. the agriculture or the dairy people might put up a strong lobby against something like this, but that is not necessarily the national interest, but decision makers, politicians will now have to weigh have to weigh what, what, is, what, what is best, uh, uh, both short term and long term. Uh, in some cases, you may decide against uh, policy that you know in the long term would be in the best interest, but to offset these uh, short term losses, you may decide against those. Gentlemen, I'd like to uh, shift gears a little bit. And in the presentation, a few things came up. And one of the most uh, problematic areas in doing business in Africa whether you want it national or regional, has been three. Access to finance, corruption, and getting the right talent. In a forward-looking kind of approach, how do we best go over these hurdles? Let's start with Alan. I think when you start with talent, it's not only skill-based, but it's also values and integrity. I think increasingly, that is widely accepted uh, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. There's still problems uh, in Imperial Bank in, in, in Nairobi, for example. Uh, but there are also success stories where governance is, is improving, um, managers are doing a better job, uh, employees, whether it's wages, uh, whether it's fair labor practices, et cetera. So I, I think it's the approach to human capital that must be more comprehensive. Uh, it can't just be driven by talent. Values, integrity are a part of that. But I think that is something also that there is assistance that can be provided for. And that is, as I alluded to before, there's, uh, I think, an underutilized talent pool of diaspora executives. Uh, 
who are making a difference across the region in other countries, but also here. You know, one of the things that I look at closely are sovereign wealth funds, which are, you know, government vehicles which control the wealth of nations, largely in, other, largely in most of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, they're resource-based. And what you find is, a large, in the record, it's still early, it's still nascent. I think the oldest one is the Pula Fund in Botswana. Uh, so they're still emerging. But the record shows that, by and large, whether it's for legitimacy, international expectations and pressure, or uh, something more intrinsic to the country itself, the diaspora is coming back and managing or running a lot of these aspirations, a lot of these enterprises. And so, I, I think the talent question is linked into uh, the values and the integrity all together. Let me just bring in Honorable uh, Guterres, and uh, in, especially in respect to um, the integrity question, corruption, and getting the right talent. How do we go over this? Let me start with corruption. I think this is the oldest question that has been discussed about not only administration, uh, political administration, governance in Africa, but also doing business in Africa. Everybody has a clear understanding of what corruption means and what needs to be done to prevent it, but also to stop it. What makes a difference from where we have seen corruption levels go low and close to non-existent has been the difference between the leadership's willingness and the commitment to actually do what they already know needs to be done. And so it will always remain a leadership question. And if we are going to address it, it will have to start with the leadership um, of our respective communities to make sure that they are not only committed, but prepared to address it, including uh, to address it through some very difficult decision that may put them at conflict with some very strong and real interests. Right. As for the issue of finance and investments and the cost of investment, I believe that governments are not doing enough. Uh, foreign direct investment is important and it's making a difference in our region and in Africa, but we cannot have development aspirations built entirely around foreign direct investments. We've got to find a way to generate sufficient resources that will transform our economies. And Governments have got to play a critical role at this stage in different ways. One, uh, we've got to find ways to reduce government spending, but also find a way to put government spending into catalytic investments that will spur uh, growth and, 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 and improve not only productivity, but growth in our, in our economies. Savings are very important, a savings culture. Uh, uh, our own citizens have got to embrace savings culture and spend less, live within our means, and put aside some money that will have to become a basis for um, affordable uh, capital. I, I wish so. Nairobi would be listening to you right now because we have a huge <laughs> conversation about um, uh, whether indeed uh, we have a cash crunch in our government. But let me just uh, bring in Alan very quickly, and then I'll give you gentlemen a chance for your closing comments before we open uh, the, the panel uh, to the audience. Um, Alan, very quickly, and then uh, sure. we'll take uh, closing comments starting from Mr. Nagatu. Sure. So two points I wanted to make on the whole notion of integrity, leadership, and, and governance. One, uh, my comments about the aspirin uh, are meant to be supplemental, meaning it's not, there's not a necessity to import talent. There's talent here and emerging. Uh, that's a way to supplement it and strengthen it. But secondly, uh, and I, I want to kind of uh, indirectly include you mm -hmm. in responsibility, not directly in the conversation, but responsibility to say that a big part of uh, the governance challenge going forward with emerging new leaders uh, is the perception that's cultivated by media. And so I, I think that that is a, a really salient factor here, is that we all too often internationally here in Sub-Saharan Africa hear a lot of the bad stories. And, that, and that's just not something that's indicative of, of African communications media. It's part of the US. It's what it feels. Right. And, and so I, I think 
that there has to be a larger conversation right. around that, where there's a larger stakeholder pool that's responsible for this. It's mm -hmm. just not management, it's just not, it's just not business leaders, it's not government officials, but it's media as well. Mm -hmm. I know we're terrible people, we enjoy bad news. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, quick uh, closing comments. Let's start from Mr. Nagatu, uh, Honorable Gattara, and then we'll finish with Alan. Just take 30 seconds, if you may, because we need to hear what the audience has to say. Uh, okay, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, I think a good place to close is these uh, two or three challenges that she highlighted. Let me just touch on the two. Uh, let me first touch the, the easier one, access to finance. You know, at a time when there's excess global liquidity and money sloshing around, uh, this issue of finance cannot be uh, the primary uh, challenge to competitivity. I think, yes, there is more money coming into this continent, whether it's sovereign wealth, all the PEs, all the color bonds, you know, blue bond, green bond, you name it, infrastructure bond, diaspora bond. So there is, a lot of money coming into the region, but not finding takers, not finding bankable projects. So I think as much focus on the, on the access to the finance, but equal focus to on developing appropriate projects. Uh, and then the role of government, yes, growing domestic revenue and so on, all of that remains. That's the easy part. The most difficult part, in my view, is the issue of corruption. I think this has become, you know, it's, it's, let me just take a second, Bonnie, to say, over the last 10 years, as we were celebrating this Africa rising narrative and so on, we, we, we glossed over the, the governance challenges because we were riding on this economic performance uh, uh, bull that, that was raging through the continent. And now, as economies begin to settle down and even uh, uh, growth numbers are beginning to be downgraded and so on, we're suddenly realizing that the, the kind of governance transformation that most of our countries need has not been had. Has not been had. Therefore, we are now suddenly realizing corruption everywhere. I mean, a few countries in this region are exceptions, but many of these countries, corruption continues to undermine efforts to integrate, to build infrastructure, and so on. So this, this is an issue we really have to grasp, grapple with and undermines competitiveness, and we need to work more on. Thanks. My conclusion is with respect to the context. We must not forget that the marketplace is global. Even as we talk about competitiveness in our region of East Africa, we are competing with the whole world. And even as we achieve greater uh, uh, integration and East African market becomes a reality, the destiny of East Africa is not integration with the rest of the world first, but integration with the rest of Africa first, and then with the rest of the world. And people must keep in mind that to be competitive within East Africa does not make you competitive in Africa necessarily, does not make you competitive uh, globally uh, as yet. Until we reach that point where we can realistically compare ourselves with the best globally, then we shall not have achieved our aspiration to become competitive. Alan, take us over. I think this is an interesting interval in the development of the competitiveness of East Africa. Today we've talked about innovation, we've talked about challenges, uh, we've talked about uh, the future in terms of the uh, demographic dividend, etc. One of the things I think that's really important to remember is that there has been progress made. Um, and it's really easy to look at East Africa and compare it to other regions of the world, particularly outside of the continent, and have uh, a less sanguine view on things. But if you look at human development, social development, attract, the ability to attract private capital, uh, those things are all good stories. Uh, I think over the longer time horizon, we'll see that competitiveness uh, is still a positive story here. But I, I think that part of what we're facing today is a lot of growth 
uh, that has to be managed in a way that I think is more in line with perhaps the interests of the private sector. Meaning, <clears throat> how do we address some of the deeper issues with, yes, there are more SMEs, uh, but maybe there is a greater need for talent among senior management. Um, yes, there is increasing pressure for tax incentives for regulatory, regulatory, regulatory policy to provide um, a complementary sort of uh, attraction to the private sector. But at the same time, uh, the innovation that's happening in this region is really extraordinary. I think the strength of the financial sector, the increasing strength of the agricultural sector and the opportunity that's there, these are all good stories. So I think there's a lot to be very pleased with. There's also a lot more work to do. But on balance, I think that East Africa is at a, a very critical point of growth that I think has implications for even positive story down the line. Thank you very much, Alan, and that brings us to a wrap on this conversation on the road to Davos, looking at strategies of improving EAC's competitiveness. Like I said earlier, this is a first of three installments of workshops and debates on the road to Davos, starting from East Africa, going to West, and finally to South. Ladies and gentlemen, my panel has consisted of Honorable Francis Gatera, Chief Executive Officer of the Rwanda Development Board and Member of the Cabinet. I also had uh, Mr. Gabriel Nagatu, Director of East African Regional Resource Center for the African Development Bank, and Wilmot Allen, who's a director for East Africa Cross Border Boundary. Please, a round of applause to my panel. <laughs> Thank you for watching this World Economic Forum debate in partnership with CNBC Africa. Uh, like I said, this is a fast of the journey on the road to Davos. <laughs>